Okay. Okay, good morning. So we started yesterday afternoon talking about network formation and models of network formation. And I listed a whole set of different types of approaches. And basically we're going through just a few examples of the different approaches to give you ideas of, of how they work and what the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches are. And what I want to do today, so when we went through you know, classic random graphs, those were, are, are nice in sort of understanding things like when does a giant component emerge? Um, why is it that uh, <coughs> we, we, we might see short paths in a, in a network? So there are certain kinds of things that those have that, are, that provide nice benchmarks, but they are missing um, two important things. One is the kind of richness that we actually see in, in networks. There's a lot of systematic deviations from, from uniformly at random behaviors. And secondly, they're missing some ideas of why we might see the particular shapes that we're seeing. They just tell us here's an algorithm for, for delivering that. And they don't necessarily tell us what would motivate that. So we looked at strategic formation, which on the other hand, gave us an answer to why we might see certain kinds of behaviors because they are um, derived from the costs and benefits and, and choices of the actors. So on, on that dimension, we, we get answers that we didn't get from the other kinds of models. But those models are very difficult and very stark, in ter difficult to solve, and are stark, um, and often have multiple equilibria. and and can be difficult to take directly to data. So um, in, in an effort to sort of move closer to data, what we're going to do is look at a class of, of random graphs, which are a little richer than the classic random graphs in terms of the kinds of, of behaviors they'll generate and the kinds of things they'll allow us to fit. So this will be sort of the first class that we'll take to data that we'll be able to, to fit. They're not going to have all the features that we might want. So there's going to be features missing here. And they're not necessarily going to have the, the answers of the why questions that we were able to answer here. And then I'm going to talk at, at the end today. So I'll go through some examples here. And then I'm going to take you through just the ideas of, of what, what's the frontier of research these days in terms of the alternative models and what the strengths and weaknesses of each of those are. So there's different approaches to trying to solve these things and to develop models we can really work with. Um, but, but there's um, still a long way to go, and, and we're, we're, not, we're not there yet. Okay, so let's start with gr growing random graphs. And, and you know, certainly, there's, there's sort of motivation for looking at, at ones. So what do I mean by growing random graphs? I mean that there's actually going to be some explicit time dimension. And the, the network's not going to be formed all at once. So if we thought about the, the models we've looked at so far, Either the, the links were just put down uniformly at random all at once, or people were forming links. Um, but we weren't looking at explicit dynamics. So here, what's going to happen is nodes are going to be born over time, and they're going to form new links at different time periods. So we're actually going to have calendar time. And that's going to give us um, different emergence of behaviors than we would see in, in a static setting. And in particular, you know, there's lots of examples of this. For instance, you know, when you write a paper, you cite other papers. Then a new paper comes in, it cites existing papers. Once a paper's written, it can't change its citations so, or, or published. Um, so, so basically, once you start looking at, at uh, the network of citations, it's going to have timestamps on it. And older, older papers are not going to be able to cite newer papers, but newer papers can cite older <laughs> papers. So that's going to give a very specific dynamic to the shape of the network. And you're going to start seeing things like older nodes are necessarily going to have a chance to have higher degrees than younger nodes are going to have. So there's a, you, know, you accumulate um, connections over time. Similarly, the World Wide Web, uh, when pages are formed, that you, you begin to put links. There you can continue to edit them, and it can continue to evolve over time. It gets a little more complicated. But there's going to be various types of, of networks where people are coming in over time. New nodes are forming relationships. Um, new scholars will start writing papers co-authoring with people. So you'll start forming networks of, of co-authorship. That'll evolve over time. Okay, so that's, that's part of it. And so, you know, wh why do we want to work with these kinds of models? So, you know, one is just, well, there's a bunch of processes that look like this, so let's model them. Well, that's not necessarily a good answer, right? Um, we don't want to just complicate our models because they match reality. What we'd like in our models is for them to be as, 
as parsimonious as possible, and we only want to complicate them if they're really bringing something uh, conceptually to the table. Um, but they will give us a natural form of heterogeneity and a form of dynamics. And most importantly, what we're going to get is we're going to get different, we're going to start to get the different kinds of distributions of degrees out that we see in the data. So the first type, these kinds of models will allow us to fit degree distributions. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we can fit degree distributions with this kind of model. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with what's known as preferential attachment. And this is, um, you know, trying to get other degree distributions that are out there besides just the Poisson distribution that we get from an Erlash-Renyi random graph. The idea is we saw, you know, situations where we had fat tails in the degree distribution. We saw some nodes with really high degree, others with really low degree. How do we get that? And uh, this was sort of the motivating example, you know, from the, the looking at the web from Albert Jung and Barabasi. They were saying here. Here's basically what we would get from an erdos renyi random graph. Here's what we actually see in the data. And we want to we explain those fat tails. So can we derive a model that does that? Okay. So power law explanations. Um, I think one of the, probably the, the paper that first nailed this um, is Simon's paper in, in 55. Um, and basically Simon said you need, there's two things you need in order to get power laws. So if you really want a linear relationship in a log-log world, if you want that strong of a, a fat tail, you need, first of all, um, so Simon wasn't looking in the context of networks, but just in, look, in the context of general, degree, or general distributions of objects. And what you need is, is you need the existing objects. So think of, you know, we can think of citations, but we could also think of things like wealth or uh, um, other kinds of things. First of all, those things have to grow um, over time in proportion to their existing size. And um, if you just use that, you would get something that might look like a log normal distribution or you can get other kinds of distributions. So that's not enough. So rich get richer is one thing we'll need. But the second thing is that we'll get, we're also going to need a time dimension where we bring in new objects over time. And so Simon pointed out if you had objects being time stamped and then growing in proportion to their size. So you start small and then you grow proportional to size and we have new objects coming in over time. That'll give you a distribution that begins to look like the extreme distributions that, that we see in power laws. Okay. So Simon pointed this out in 1955 and then I'll give you an explicit recipe for this um, coming from Barabasi and Albert. And actually it turns out that Price had, had written a paper in 1976 which um, basically had the same model that uh, Barabasi and Albert had um, in a more specific context. So, so um, Price was talking explicitly about uh, citation networks and just talking about how citations evolve over time, whereas um, Barabasi and Albert did this in a more general application. Okay, so these previous models don't have the fat tails. So what's, what's the preferential attachment in a nutshell? The idea is you, you, we have a network, nodes are born over time, and they form links at random to, with existing nodes, so there's going to be some randomness in it. But it's not going to be that I just pick nodes uniformly at random. I'm going to pick the nodes that I attach to in proportion to their current degrees. Okay? So I'm going to form links with probability proportional to the number of links that a, that a node already has. So if somebody already has 10 connections, somebody else has 5 connections, then I'm going to connect to the one that has 10 with twice the probability that I'm going to connect to the one with 5. That's the, the idea of preferential attachment. So I'm still going to have some chance of connecting to both, but the one with 10 is going to start gaining more links um, over time. And then you can see that that's going to have a, a feedback effect, right? So once I'm larger, I have a higher probability of getting new links. I'm going to grow more. Then I get even larger. I get even more links. So this is what's going to give us that really fat tail where I'm going to get some nodes that get really, really high degrees. And other nodes, if I don't get any, any <coughs> links, it's going to be hard for me to ever get any links because now my probability is really low. That's going to be the thing that drives us towards those tails. Okay? That's the intuition of getting those extreme distribution, the ex extremities in the distribution. There's been some attempt to, uh, to provide a, uh, a micro foundation. It, yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, there, so, so far, there's no story behind this. And what I'll do is I'll give you a story in a little while. Um, I'll give you a network search story, which is going to justify this in, in a bit. But the, 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 the preferential attachment 
um, does, doesn't come with necessarily a, a strong story behind it so far. Yes? Right, right, right. So, so, so in case people couldn't hear it, so Ben was saying word usage is another thing. Um, Zipf's law uh, applies to word usage, how frequently you see words used in the, um, in, you know, just take a text and count how often a word is used. That'll have some words that are used extremely often, others that aren't used at all. And what's Ben pointing out is if you learn from reading, then you're more likely to learn words that are, are repeated very often, and that gives words that are repeated very often a chance to pop up more in the, popu in the population. So you, know, you can think of that as exposure to the current thing. And, and what we're going to, uh, the story just in a, in, in a snapshot of what we will do later to get this out is to say, let's suppose, for instance, that I meet existing, uh, existing nodes through the network. So if you remember the friendship paradox that, that nodes that have more friends are going to be represented more in the network. If I start searching through the network to find new people, I'm going to find people who have more friends more easily than finding people who have fewer friends. So we'll be able to get this kind of thing out through a search algorithm where I begin to, and, and that's natural to think of in terms of citation networks, right? Part of the way that you find papers to cite is by reading other papers. So papers that are cited a lot are easy to find in the literature. Papers that aren't cited are very difficult to find. And, and, the, and yeah, they're made uncited, exactly. So, so that's going to be the story. And that's going to give us, and I think, you know, the, the thing to emphasize about this in terms of networks is it's going to be a way of getting inequality out. It's going to be a driver of inequality in a very natural way. So if we want to understand inequality, here this is going to be a network story for why you might get extreme inequality. It's going to be a feedback in terms of which nodes get gain links, and if links translate into opportunities or wealth or other kinds of things, that's going to be important in terms of determining the outcomes of, of the society. Is there a possibility of just a link dying out? Yes, yeah, so what you can do is you could also, so here this story is going to be one where once the citation is there, it's there forever. But you could also have situations where, um, you know, if it's a friendship, friendships come and they go. And so they, they might disappear over time. And uh, if you do that, then that's going to alter this model. And you can, uh, I'll, I'll show you sort of a technique for solving it, and you can do it with, with um, link disappearing. And depending on how you do that, you'll get different degree distributions. So then that'll, that'll work against this sort of, um, because people will be losing. It depends on how, how much you lose at what rate. Okay. Okay, so, so just to, you know, I'll uh, 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 first give you a, a picture of one of these graphs, and um, this doesn't, you know, it looks visibly, doesn't look that different from what we saw before, but this one is one that was generated by preferential attachment compared to the ones I showed you before that were generated um, with the uniform probability. Uh, and what's, what's unique here, um, I'm not sure you can see the numbers, but this is node one, this is node two, node three, node four, um, node one, Started, everything started with a couple of links, and then um, links were added. Each new node added a couple of links to existing nodes in this um, diagram. But what happens is 2, 3, and 4 were early nodes. They ended up getting a lot of links because they were early on. They gained more, and they're the most um, highest degree nodes in the, in, in the network. And this will typically be what, what happens. And eventually, if we kept doing this, um, now if I added new links, I'd be adding new links with much higher probability to these nodes than the other nodes um, under this algorithm. And so they'll continue to grow, and, and eventually they'll get, it's going to look like these are really strong hubs in the overall network. It's just bad luck. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so one thing that's going to happen is by bad luck and in, in early on, if it doesn't get cited, then it's going to have a really hard time getting cited, but two got really lucky, and then it's going to keep getting cited, and, and that's going to grow very exponentially. Um, Okay. Okay, so um, let's do a, a version of this. So newborn nodes form M links to existing nodes. So what we're going to do is do a simple version where each date a new node is born, and it's going to put out some number of links. So you write a new paper, and what we're going to assume is every paper has a, a citation list of 20. So it's just going to cite 20 other papers. So we have some rigid rule, um, and everybody puts in 20 citations. 
So now you're going to pick the previous papers to cite based on that. So um, after T periods, there's going to be T papers written. Then each one is written in sequence here. So we'll just think of time as the sequencing of the papers. Then we have TM links in total. And that means that the total degree in the network is 2 times TM, right? So each citation has uh, two ends to it. Um, so I'm going to be a little loose here on, on the direction of the links, but I'll, I'll tell a story that's going to be partly based on citations and partly based on friendships. So I'll be moving back and forth between directed and undirected uh, versions of this, but I'll try and be explicit about that. So um, what the, the key thing is, now if I look at somebody, somebody, some existing node's degree, so think of how many citations it has, um, or how many links it has. Now I look at the total number of links that are out there and the probability that I connect to any, I send one of my links to any given node is just proportional to its degree compared to the total degree that's out there. Okay? So now I look at all the, link, uh, all the existing nodes and each one I pick with that proportional probability. Is it, is it clear what the model is then? Okay, so simple model. Now, um, <coughs> solving this uh, analytically with the full probability distribution turns out to be a little tricky. Um, it's been done now. Uh, Balabash and Reardon have a paper on it. There's several papers that have managed to do it. But the original approach to doing this was instead of actually solving it, the full uh, evolution of the probability distribution, people used what's well known as a mean field approximation. So I'm going to take you through a mean field approximation of this and, and actually showing that the, the, the process itself follows this is a non-trivial proof. So it's, um, it, it's harder to show that the, this is the real process rather than the, an approximation. So what's a, what's a mean field approximation? What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to make two simplifying assumptions. Um, one is this is the essential one and, and the other one is just uh, to make our calculus a little easier. So first of all, we're going to do a continuous time approximation. That will allow us just to, to do differential equations um, rather than, than keeping track of, of sums. And the second is what we're going to do is, is instead of looking at the actual random degrees, we're going to assume everything happens with the expected probabilities. So instead of keeping track of the actual realization of, of new links, we're going to say, how many links did I expect to get in this period? So each node will actually be getting an expected number of, of links over time, and we're just going to keep track the expectation of what each node should look like over time rather than the actual distribution. Okay? So I'll, I'll take you through the mean field approximation, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk through what, you know, how you might analyze that this is the right distribution um, itself. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the field part comes from physics. So this is a technique that's been um, used quite heavily in, in physics for approximating complex dynamic systems where it's going to be difficult to actually solve it. And, and so you're looking at field equations. And, and so basically it's been used in that. Exactly. So, so it turns out in this particular setting, it works. Um, it has not been proven. I, I don't know of proofs. So actually, I did, when I wrote the, the, uh, my book, um, Social and Economic Networks, I, I spent a lot of time trying to, to track down what was known about mean field approximations. And there are several theorems that cover, there's one that covers preferential attachment. You can do one, um, actually in the, in the book I added one that, that covers the, a growing version of Arash Reni, but I don't know of ones that cover general classes of dynamic systems and says, when is this, is this reasonable to do and when isn't it? So it, they're not always good approximations, um, and it's sometimes adding the heterogeneity can really change the system. And I think it, it basically it depends on how multiplicative the system is. Um, and, but, but I don't know of, of, the, of theorems that actually cover it. Okay, so, so let's, let's look at, at this system and just look at how the evolution, how we can solve for what the degree distribution looks like. So... We, now we're just going to track the, the change of a particular degree of some node i um, at time t. So keep track of node i. This is its degree at time t. And how is it changing at time t? Well, it's gaining new links. And what it's gaining in terms of new links, 
The, this is its degree. The chance that it's getting any new link is di over 2tm, right? This is its, its degree compared to the total. And there's m new links being formed, so it has m chances to get one. So this is sort of an expectation how many new links it's going to gain. Okay? So we have a, a, a rate of change. Cancel the m's out. So this looks like di over 2t is, is how fast it's going to be growing over time. And we have a starting condition. It's when it started, it had M links. So the day it was born, it started with M links. And let's just have the notation where what we'll do is we'll, we'll track nodes just by their birth date. So um, node I was born at time I. So if node one was born at time one, node two was born at time two and so forth, they formed um, M links um, when they were born. We have to worry a little bit about this, you know, what were the first links formed to? Um, I'm going to circumvent that problem, but basically assume that there were just a few nodes to absorb the initial links in the first period. Okay, so, so we, have, we have a differential equation with a, a, a starting condition here. So this is an easy one to solve. And you solve it. What's the solution to this differential equation? It looks like di looks like m t over i to square root. So easy solution to this equation. That's what the, how, how nodes are going to grow over time. Okay? So um, in terms of a picture, so let's suppose that uh, M was 20. So we had our 20 citations that each paper was putting out. And we look after 100 periods. And I look at what's the expected number of, of citations that each paper should have by that time. And so we go through and, and basically the one that's just born um, is just going to have degree 20. It just formed 20 links. Um, older ones are going to have larger ones. And what's critical here, here we're seeing the rich get richer. The ones that were born in the earlier stages um, have the highest gain they're, they're going. And basically this is really, um, we've got a, a curve here that's, uh, that, that, that's showing that preferential attachment and rich, richer effect. Okay. So is it clear what this is? Okay. So now, um, when we want to figure out what this degree distribution looks like, there's sort of two things. Now we can see where the mean field approximation came in. What we're doing is, in fact, um, as we saw in the actual graph we had, it might be that node one got lucky or unlucky. So this older node might not have gotten so lucky and, and gained things. There should be noise in this graph. And instead, what we're doing is just solving for what the expectation is. So we're smoothing this thing out where the actual distribution would be much noisier. So we, we will have to check at the end, then the, 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 the real distribution, if we noise these up, would still have the same frequency distribution as this does in terms of, of assuming that everything happened at the expected rate. So maybe, you know, one would be down here, but two, somebody else should be up there. So we, we would want to make sure that even though um, we, we've added, we would add noise, that we wouldn't change the actual shape of the curve if we rearrange the nodes. Right, right. So, so right now, I, I've, I've just said, okay, this is what the degree is at some period t. And then what we can do is we could solve for what the degree distribution should be at any period t. And then we could also send t to infinity. And then you just open the distribution Yeah, so actually here what's going to happen is the distribution is going to, when we're doing this expectation, the distribution is going to hit, um, if, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. You'll see in a second. Um, we won't have to normalize. Okay, so, so this is the, um, the degree of different nodes as a, as a function of their birth date. So now if we want to figure out um, what's the fraction of nodes with degree less than some number d, then basically all we have to do is, yeah, um, look back at this curve and tilt it and say, okay, uh, if, if this is the degree I'm looking at, say, you know, um, 35, then all the nodes that were born after the node that has exactly d, d35 are going to have degree less than 35. So I would just have to say, you know, what's this node? And then compare it to, there's a, a hundred that have been born. What's the fraction of ones that are o uh, old, sorry, younger than that will be the ones that um, are, have the, the lower degree. So 
if I can just solve then for which, which node has exactly some degree at some time, well, that's the, um, for degree D, just inverting this, it's going to be the i's that are bigger than m squared t over d squared, right? They're, they're going to be the ones that have degree less than d, okay? So, so now, if, if I want, so the critical i for some d is this, given this by, by this equation, then if I want to figure out what the distribution looks like, right, it's 1 minus, well, i was born at time i, there's t nodes ov overall, so it's the ones that are younger than, than i, so that's just 1 minus i over t, right? So I'm just going back here and saying, okay, this is i compared to t, um, 1 minus i over t is, is the ratio of, of nodes that are going to be younger. So the, the degree distribution is then 1 minus m squared over d squared. So we've gotten the degree distribution here, at least for expectations, over time. Right, so, so, um, so now what this is, is, this is actually the distribution of expected degrees, um, not the actual distribution of degrees. And what you're saying is, well, you know, why is it that the degrees come out to follow this, this actual curve? And it happens here that if you noise this up, some will, get, some will get more, some will get fewer, but it happens that they'll still follow this, this distribution. Um, that was what was proven rigorously in the Balabash and Reardon paper. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to do for... The way I, I did it for the, um, f for the exponential distribution, and there it's fairly easy because you can use turnoff. Um, doing it for this is a little trickier. So showing that the actual noise in the distribution is all going to cancel out and you're going to end up with this expectation in terms of the overall distribution with probability going to one, um, it's, it, it, it's not easy. Um, it, I mean, it's not hard, but it's, it, it takes uh, a bit of work. Right, so, so in fact, um, good point. So what's important, um, here we have one born every period. Let's suppose we, if, if we had 10 born every period, that wouldn't cause a problem. But if we had a growing number, if we had the population grow over time, then that would change the distribution. And then if, if the growth rate was fast enough, then the noise could be more problematic. And so it, it, if you do it at a constant rate, you'll still get the same equations because then it's just going to be, it's as if you're scaling up the nodes. So, so actually just... I would, I would expect a variation among those 10. You, you'll get some variation among those 10, but it actually smooths things out rather than causes more. Because now, here we've already got, we've, we've got noise because there's be variation in, uh, among the ones that were born earlier and later. And sort of adding more at any given date actually sort of works like a law of large numbers where now the ones born at a given date are going to begin to, on average, balance out correctly and, and, and things smooth out. So, so that doesn't cause problems, but if I'm changing the rate at which they're coming into the system, then I change this differential equation and I change things in, in ways that then can make the, um, the older nodes have more of an impact than the younger ones because there's more and more younger ones and that then being older, it gives you more and more of an advantage. And once you skew that distribution enough, then you lose the ability to do a mean field approximation. So there, okay, so I'm not going to take you through a proof that this is actually, I'm not taking you through Balabash and Reardon. Um, you, you can look at their paper and, and check that it works. Um, so, the, the, but this is a, a technique that works for, um, for, for this kind of distribution. Yes, yeah, so one interesting thing about this, the T canceled out. Right? So suddenly we don't have t, and that's partly because we're doing this mean field. Um, the, the continuous time approximation is as if we have the nodes that were born close to ti closer and closer to time zero have a chance to grow off to infinity. And if we had done this in a discrete time and I hadn't done the continuous time approximation, then we would have t's hanging around and the equations would have been harder to work out. 
So this sort of converges very quickly to its limit because we're, we're doing things at the expected rate and I did it in continuous time. If I'd done it in a discrete time, then we would have had t's hanging around. Can you see a little bit more of the continuous time approximation? Yeah, right. So, so here, effectively what I'm doing is, is um, talking about you know, the growth of this at, at, of node i at time t, and I solved it like a differential equation. Well, that's sort of assuming that there's nodes being born at every instant. So it's not just that a node was born at time one. So there's, we're, we're sort of keeping track of a continuous distribution of nodes. Instead of one node born every period, you have an infinitesimal. Yes, yeah, so we're, 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 born, we've, we're having nodes, small nodes born at all times. So we basically are looking at a continuum model of, of, of nodes implicitly when we're, forming, when we're doing the continuous time approximation. And that gives us the convergence of this thing right to the, to the limit. Um, it, for any finite time, we've already got an infinite number. And so we get instant convergence. So, uh, is there, so um, I think there is the, the bound, which is the error of this approximation by means to the real distribution. So what drives it higher and makes it lower? Yeah, so if you look at how far off this is, um, I don't remember the rates of convergence. But, um, you know, basically as you run time out over time, it's going to get more accurate and, and there's going to be bounds on, on uh, w w the nodes' birth dates as to how close they are to. So, so ones that have only been around for a short period of time can have more variance and then it gets more accurate as you go further out in the tail. So the distribution of nodes that are older um, gets more accurate, but the ones that are just born can have more variation in them. So you've sort of got, in the, in the approximation, you've got a constant noise in, in the one tail, in the lower tail, and then it smooths out as it goes up. So but I don't remember the equation ex exactly. It's not uniform? It's not uniform, no, no. Yes? Uh, can you distinguish that original attachment from a situation in which the position is better than the Yeah, 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 good, good. Um, so, so the question is, you know, maybe, maybe instead of what's driving this, so here if we think about citations, we've got that um, what's happening is, is it's just you're getting lucky and I'm older and I'm easier to, f to find and so I get more citations. Well, suppose instead we had a model where there's some good papers and, and some uh, worse papers and uh, better papers get cited with a higher frequency. So you can work out a model like that. But now what we'd have to do is put in a value for that and then we might assume that the the um, chance that you link to somebody is proportional to the value. But what's going to happen in that is then the relative linking probabilities are always going to be proportional to values. And so they won't be proportional. So being a lot older doesn't give me a much bigger advantage over the younger nodes. So what's going to happen in that distribution is you're not going to get as, as extreme a distribution. So as I get older, you know, if, if my paper is twice as good as somebody else's, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it can't accumulate more than a new paper that's written, which is half as good, is still going to get half the citations as the older paper. So the age distribution won't, and it won't get you quite as extreme a distribution as this. So um, you, you can work that out as a, as a different model, and you could use techniques which are very similar to this. You just get a different differential equation and a different um, degree distribution. Yeah, so they have a paper where, where they do a combination of, of, of valence um, and uh, so you can actually um, mix the two models where you have some value and, and some preferential attachment and then you get a family of, of things and, and you can differentiate. Um, but basically what it, it'll flatten the distribution out some. So it's still going to look different than uniform at random, but it won't be as extreme as this distribution. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, part of it, you know, it depends on really what the application is and what we might think of as, you know, what's driving the increase in the number of nodes. And, and for instance, if we look at, at scientific production, there's just more researchers now than there were. So the, the population of researchers is increasing. So if we start looking at, at, there's more articles being written, it's not actually a splitting process, but it's a process where just uh, each, each year now, there's more and more papers being written. And so if we think of preferential attachment, then if I'm finding older papers via this process, now I've got more and more papers coming in each year, and, and that's going to have a growth process. And that changes the number of new links being formed at each time, and, and it's going to change things. But it's, then it's not a splitting process. It's just a, a population difference. Where you could also think of, you know, maybe I've got a web page and I start dividing it, or I do some, um, but that would be a different process, yeah. So No, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, as people are pointing out, I think there's, there's many different variations on these kinds of models now that you can think of. And once you start thinking of those variations, so you, know, you can begin to solve what those models look like, and they're going to give you, that's going to attenuate things as well, right? So, so what, one thing here, and this works well for citation networks, but not maybe for friendship networks, you can't have an infinite number of friends. I mean, you just don't have time for it. So if you have something where there's diminishing returns, that's going to limit how big your degree could get, and that could, could change things. Or you could bring in the idea that, that nodes you know, are, are going to lose links over time, and, and that would, would mitigate these things. So you, know, you can put in those variations on this kind of model, um, and some of them will be easily solved, some won't. Some, for some, the mean field works well. For some, the mean field doesn't work. So it's a little dicey in terms of when the mean field works properly. But one can, can take these kinds of techniques and, and play with variations on the models. And then um, often what's done is you could simulate the model too. So if I don't know whether or not the mean field approximation is good, the, a standard technique is I solve the mean field approximation, then I run a lot of simulations, and I hope that the simulations come out to match the, the actual mean field. And if it does, I feel somewhat reassured if I can't prove that the actual distribution matches the mean field itself. Okay, so we end up with this equation. Um, so then we end up with uh, you know, a power law where the, the, the frequency distribution is proportional to d to the minus 3. So in fact, here we, we end up not only with a power law, but you end up with a power law with a very specific exponent, which came from the fact that the d is growing uh, at a, a, a rate proportional to the inverse of t, and then that... Uh, you know, gave us the one half here. Um, so we ended up with the d squared in the, the CDF. That becomes the d cubed when we go to the, so, so we trace the exponent through to the very specific process that, that we had, right? So y3, that's coming from this. And basically it's now we've got, we've got a log log world where the slope is minus three. Okay, so good news about this. We got a power law, we got a very different distribution. Um, as we were pointing out, why preferential attachment? Uh, we've, we've told a few different stories for that, so we could st start to tell stories for, for that. Um, a problem with this is it's still not, you know, what it's given us one other distribution, but now we've got two distributions to work with, right? Sort of Poisson distribution, and, and then we've got this other distribution, preferential attachment, um, giving us a power law, but maybe there's a lot of things in between. Most things aren't going to fit into one of these two bins. So this isn't going to be a very good econometric model or statistical model for going to data and saying, you know, what's actually driving my process? I won't be able to back much out from that. Um, so we can't really fit degree distributions with this. So, so um, let's go through a, a friends of friends. So um, I wrote a paper with Brian Rogers where what we did was try to build a class of, of distributions that would span these that would allow us to actually go to data and fit degree distributions. And um, it turns out there's sort of an interesting... Um, so Murray Gelman, who's a physicist, um, has a book called the, uh, the Quark and the Jaguar, or the Jaguar and the Quark. I don't remember which is uh, Quark and the Jaguar. Um, and in a footnote of it, he talks about, you know, so power laws come up a lot in, in physics, but there's also a lot of distributions of things that, that end up somewhere um, in between power laws and other kinds of distributions. 
And so he suggested a family of distributions. He, this would be a nice family of distributions for fitting um, uh, things that we see in these emerging systems. It turns out that that family is going to be exactly what we get out from this kind of model. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, new nodes are going to be born, but what we're going to do is we're going to allow them to form links in, in two different ways, and we're going to vary those ways, that proportion. And um, <clears throat> you're going to still form M links when you're born, so we'll keep the same model, but now when I form my M links, I'm going to form them in two different ways. A proportion A of them, I'm going to just do uniformly at random to the existing nodes. And then what I'm going to do is from those nodes, so think of this as, as I, I'm writing a paper. So I look up 10 papers that are already, you know, so I do a keyword search. Maybe I go into Google Scholar. I'm writing something on networks and trade. I type in networks and trade. Ten pa I just go through the first page. 10 papers pop up. I look at those papers and I cite them. Then what I do is I find the other ones by reading those papers and finding um, papers out of their citation list. So I iterate on you know, randomly finding a paper, then tracking its citations, then randomly finding another paper, tracking its citations. And what we'll do is A will be the proportion of time I'm just uniformly at random picking things. And then 1 minus A is going to be the chance that I'm, I'm searching their citation list or their neighbors and then finding new nodes through the neighbors. Okay. So is the, is the process clear? Okay. So if you remember, f f yeah. It, it's, it's create what in the distribution? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Good point. Yes, you got it. Um, so w we're also going to get clustering out here too, naturally. So in the, in the previous preferential attachment model, when I connected to two different nodes, I was connecting to them in proportion to their degrees, but the chance that I actually connect to two that are connected to each other is still very low. So you're not going to get much clustering in that. Here, when I cite a paper and then cite a paper that it cites, I'm naturally closing... It's going to be naturally transitive, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm actually creating triangles and doing that. So one other thing that you're going to get out of this as a byproduct is you'll get clustering out as a byproduct of this kind of, of model. Okay, so now if you remember Ben's talk from yesterday, um, when we actually follow a search process in the network and we think through this friendship paradox, the chance that I find somebody... So think of a, of a paper that has 100 citations and a paper that has 50 citations. Well, I'm randomly picking papers and then looking at what it's cited. I, I have twice a, a, as high a chance of finding the one that has 100 citations as the one that has 50 citations. So searching through the citation lists is going to give me exactly preferential attachment in terms of the proportion of times I'm going to, I'm going to find different, um, different papers to cite. So, so following this process, part of it is going to be uniformly at random, and the other part is going to look exactly like preferential attachment. Right? So now we can just go through, you know, um, so the, the distribution of neighbor's nodes is not the same as the degree distribution, so that gives us this, um, you know, extra weight, the preferential attachment part. So when we look at, at randomly picking one of its neighbors, the chance of finding that node is proportional to its degree. I'm going to find nodes that have higher degree with higher probability proportional to how often they're already cited. Okay? So, so now we can do the same kind of math we did before. We'll just do a mean field approximation. I'm finding A uniformly at random, 1 minus A via friends of friends. So what does that look like? Let's redo this equation. The 1 minus A part's going to look exactly like it did before. It looks just like preferential attachment. The A part, instead, is just going to be proportional to how many nodes are out there. Right? There's T nodes at time T, so the chance that I get one of these uniformly at random ones is just 1 over T. So if A, fraction AM of those things are being formed uniformly at random, this is the expected ones I'm going to get uniformly at random. So now we just have a slightly different differential equation than we had before, but we can go ahead and solve it. We still have the same starting condition, different uh, equation. We just solve it, um, and that gives us di now looks like this function. Um, it's a little more complicated, but it's, it's still something that we can solve analytically. Okay, so is it clear what we just did? So exactly the same exercise we did before with, a, with just a different um, rate of growth, 
And now what's going to happen is A goes to zero, everything is going to look like preferential attachment. As A goes to one, then everything's as if these links are formed uniformly at random, but in a growing network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to start it with, uh, I don't remember exactly how many. You, um, you have to seed it with a set of nodes that we won't sort of, old nodes born before time zero will we'll, we'll assume we can absorb the initial one. So we'll start with some sti starting conditions, say. Um, so I, I have to have at least M and putting in, I think you need a few more than M. And then I can form the, the ones existing and then after that, then I don't have to worry. So start at time zero with an existing set, and then if you're actually doing the simulation, then we'll just have to keep track of an extra, you know, our time's gonna get shifted by, um, by how many of we started with. Okay, so uh, you know, then we can go through, where, where's the critical, the critical I is gonna be the I, um, you know, now we've just got a different, uh, different equation for which is going to be the one that has degree D at time T. We end up with the same, exactly the same technique, but just different equations at each point in time. So you can solve for what's the critical I. Um, and then you get a, de a degree distribution. Uh, and now it looks like this. Um, <clears throat> if I put A to be um, zero, so none of them are being formed at random and everything's being formed through finding friends of friends. Then what does this thing begin to look like? If A is zero, then effectively this is going to look like the M over D and this is going to be um, two again. So we're going to end up with exactly the same equation we had from the power law. As, <clears throat> as A goes to one, then what does this thing converge to? Um, as A goes to one, this looks like 2m, but the, you've got this x here, and the x is 2 over 1 minus a. This thing is, is blowing up. So you have to use L'Hopital's rule to figure out what this converges to. It converges to an exponential distribution. So this looks like an exponential distribution if you've got um, just uniform at random formation, and it looks like <coughs> preferential attachment if we go to the other extreme where we're finding everything through the, through the network. So is it, is it clear what we're getting here? Okay, so um, how do you fit this? So now what we've got is a family of distributions. You can actually take them to data, so they're gonna change their, their fit. Um, <clears throat> I won't go through the details of it, but eff effectively we can just fit this to data by saying, here's the actual degree distribution. Let's find the, 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 the degree distribution out of this family that comes closest to matching that. And you can use different metrics. So you can fit it by method of moments, or you can use um, <clears throat> various maximum likelihood techniques. We actually show that you, it's a, you can use a contraction mapping to try and estimate this by an iterative procedure. There's different ways you can actually do the estimation techniques. None of them are that hard, they're pretty standard. But basically now I've got an existing empirical distribution from my, from my data. Now I've got a family of distributions and what we can estimate is then the A process. So for instance, we might wanna know what's A. Is this a network that looks like it was rich get richer or does it look like a network where things were formed pretty much uniformly at random, right? So here are some different um, degree distributions from different data sets. And here are the A's that come out if you try and find the best fit of the degree distribution to them. So for instance, um, this is a citation network. This is the network of all the papers that cite the uh, Watson Strogatz paper. So the small world's paper. Um, so you can look through that. What does the A come out to be? It comes out to be about 0.38. And the R squared on that's pretty high. So if you actually look at the, the, you know, the distance, the, the actual um, amount of, of variance that you're explaining in terms of degree distribution is very, you get a really good fit. So the actual distribution um, is matched pretty closely. So this says that about 40% of the links in the citation network look like they're at random and about 60% look like they're being formed um, via preferential attachment or some rich get richer kind of process. Then you can look at um, you know, the prison inmate uh, network we talked about before. There it looks like A is, is one. So it looks pretty much it, it, like things are form, formed at random. The high school romance network, um, A is one. So that one really looks like um, random 
uh, random, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, then there's a, a radio network, an old ham radio. I'm not sure how many of you know what, what a ham radio is, but amateur radio operators, um, that one has, you know. So you get, you, can get, you get a whole family of these. And interestingly, when you go back to the Albert, Jong, and Barabasi paper, um, when you look at that one, the A that you fit comes out to be about 0.36. So a little more than a third of them look like they're actually random, and it, it's not a power law that you're getting. So even though it looks pretty linear, um, when you actually put A.36, you get something that looks almost linear on a log-log plot, but there's a bit of curvature up at the tail that's just hard to see. And so that, that, that's a caution in terms of you know, just eyeballing plots and saying this looks pretty linear um, could be pretty far from the truth in terms of whether it's, it's something that's a real mixture of two different distributions or whether it's really um, strongly a power law. So this is statistically distinguishable from a power law. <coughs> Any questions on that? So what method works best, like iteration stuff? Or? For fittingness? Yeah, yeah so um, I think the iteration works is the fastest. Doing maximum likelihood or GMM in this world is, is computationally quite intensive. I can explain what the trade-offs are and the different techniques, um, but I, I don't, I don't want to spend time, I, I have to spend a lot of time sort of building up how, exactly how you program those things, uh, but I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Yes? Sorry, but the M is also a parameter. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, the M is really easy to, to estimate because the M is just the average degree here. So, so you, can, you can get that directly out of, of just looking at the average degree. So, so the, you know, the A is the hard thing to fit, and then the, the average is just, you, you just use the point average, and that's um, direct. Yeah. Yes. Shouldn't all the, the links of female be male? Yeah, yeah, so this is a bipartite network. So then, then A has to be more than A, right? Um, not necessarily. Yeah, this is just the degree. So, yeah, yeah, just the degree distribution. So even in a bipartite network, you could still have um, a power law. I mean, it could be that some nodes have lots of partners and, and other ones have very few partners. So it, it, the, the fact that it's bipartite doesn't, doesn't disturb the actual degree distribution itself. Um, and and that's, a, that's actually a peculiar network because it's almost completely bipartite. There's very few um, homosexual relationships in there. And that tells us that there's probably bias in the sample in a survey because it, there probably should be more than are reported in that survey. Um, it, it, it looks like almost an entirely bipartite network, but, but even bipartite, it, that doesn't necessarily change the, the degree distribution. Is there also as many the same people who don't report their homosexual they report their same? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, it's possible that then you end up with an over-report of isolated nodes. Um, I, I don't know exactly how the, yeah, so, so you know, ch checking whether there's bias, maybe it's the age, maybe it's, it's a survey bias response. Um, so those things are, are difficult to, to back out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Right, 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 right. Yes, good point. So, so, so another thing you could do, as, you, as you're pointing out, is you could begin to say, um, you know, these networks are actually born over time. You know what the timestamps are in the nodes, and we have predictions about, about older nodes having higher degrees, so we can begin to check that. And so, you know, like in the citations network, if you do check it, um, citations are growing over time. Um, the growth rate matches pretty closely in terms of, of what's predicted here. You also get an assortativity. So it's going to be that older... Older nodes have a higher chance of having older citations, too. So young nodes can't, by definition, have young. So you can, you can begin to look at that pattern, that pattern. So you get a lot of things that match in the citation network. The high school romance network is going to be a miserable fit in terms of that because all the nodes come in, by definition, they're all in the same grade, basically. You know? So they're, they're all coming in at the same age. So that's not, you know, this model is not a great model for fitting that. And in fact... Um, you know, the high school romance looks more almost like an erdos reni random network more than one that was gotten through this growing process where you're going to have different age nodes um, having different degrees. Okay. 
Um, clustering, as we mentioned, you can get clustering out naturally from this because I'm connecting to friends of friends. Um, okay, so, so let's sort of summarize where we are and then I want to spend a little time talking about you know, where the state of the art is in, in terms of this kind of estimation um, these days. Okay, so the classic random graphs, they told us how we might see certain kinds of things like short average path, no why, but they're very useful benchmarks. So this is a great null hypothesis and some of the techniques that we learn from those graphs are useful to, to take otherwise. Strategic formation, nice for the why and give us some, some welfare analysis and other kinds of things under an externalities. Hard to solve, hard to estimate. So these aren't, so, so far people have been struggling to take these directly to data. And I, I'll say a little more about that when we talk about some, something down here. Growing random graphs, they give us some answer to why. So now we've got a little bit of a clue. Maybe it's through search in the network. And I think that's an important insight in the sense that you know, if we think that things are driven by the network processes and the network is actually controlling information and the ability to find other nodes, that's going to have consequences that then have feedback effects and can lead to more inequality in the degree distributions. So um, some, we're getting some Y answers out, but still no welfare, so there wasn't any welfare analysis there. And it's a limited class. So it does have very specific properties to it. It's not, for instance, going to allow us to, to do anything with homophily. There's no homophily in that system. There's no, we didn't put anything in about node characteristics or anything like that. So we're, there's still going to be a lot that's missing from that kind of, of model if we want to go to data. So then, then we you know, can start looking at, at various other kinds of models that have been proposed to try and take things more directly to data. Right, right. So, so exactly. So you, you, you're right. You can enrich this kind of, of model to say have different types and now have a bias in the probability of attachment and then solve that kind of differential equation. And it gets a little more complicated, but it, it can be done. So th that, that sort of answers things to some extent. But I think, so no homophily. We can enrich this class to have homophily. Um, the, 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 I think part of the limited class here so one thing that's true about this in terms of, say, um, your ability to generate clustering is the clustering and other kinds of things are fixed by the process. It's, it's only a, a, a basically a two-parameter family. So we had this, this one parameter, which is the average number of new connections that people are forming. The other parameter was sort of how many I formed uniformly at random versus preferential attachment. But we only... Yeah, so now I have the third parameter I can add, which will enrich sort of, of some aspects of it, but it's not quite rich enough to, to actually match, they say, the prevalence of, of triangles in the network or other kinds of things. So it still misses on a lot of dimensions that we, we, that we actually are interested in. And it's kind of cumbersome for the homophily. Um, it gets really tr tricky to solve. So most people that have worked at the homophily have worked more with block models and other variations of those models. But you're right, I mean, you, these can be enriched further. And I think also, you know, so one, one way to go is to start looking at growing strategic models or growing models with types and people's preferences based on those or, or qualities, other kinds of things. So, you know, building richer um, growing random graphs. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little time on block models and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish up by saying a little bit about um, exponential random graph models. Okay, so what, what do block models do? And, and this is, this is a set of models that are used really, really frequently. Um, what do they do? Basically, you, you ex expand the basic GNP model. So things are going to be put down independently, uniformly at random. But now we'll just introduce nodes having characteristics. So this is a, a simpler model of, uh, to bring the nodes having characteristics in. So we can just have age, gender, religion, profession. We'll, we'll, each node will be a... a, a just a, a list of what its types are. And you know, then we've got node attributes, so we can think of these nodes of different types, and then we'll just have probabilities of connecting that instead of having one uniform probability, the probabilities could be dependent on the types. So we, you know, we end up having a probability of blues to blues, probabilities of greens to greens, probabilities of greens to yellows, and so forth. So we have a bunch of different probabilities we can estimate, and this type of model is obviously going to be really easy to estimate 
because we just look at frequencies of connections between those types, and that's our point estimate for whatever the, the, the chance of this type of thing being present is. So this is, that's why this model is so prevalent. A lot of times when people are looking at, at networks, they'll just you know, quote what are the, le the frequencies between, of connections between different types of, of nodes. Right, so you know, we end up with estimates based on, on just direct counts. Um, so the, it doesn't have to be finite. So the, um, the, the, the standard technique to doing continuous covariates would be, for instance, doing, say, a logistic regression, where what we might do is say, what's the, you know, let's think of uh, the, the probability of a link between some node I and J. It's going to depend on some characteristics that I has and J has. And we might say, for instance, this would be a standard um, formulation you see a lot used in, with uh, studies of the ha ad health um, data set. So you, you have a list of covariates for each. And then say, um, if we think there's homophily, we might say that, that there's a, a negative parameter here on how different the, the nodes are. So we look at the distance between the, the, the nodes um, types, and then we think that there might be a parameter there. And then we just say, okay, the log odds that we are connected um, is a function, say a linear function of that. That's, this would be a standard sort of um, block model um, done in logistic style for continuous covariates. So you can do it with continuous covariates. Um, you know, you could do probit or logit or what, whatever type of, of um, continuous regressions you want. Is that any questions on that? So, so these models are easy to do. You could partition them, do it for finite types. Homophily is just going to be higher probabilities for same types. If you do it in logistic sense, then um, you know, th this kind of test would just be a test of whether you've got a negative coefficient on the distance between the, the um, attributes of the agents. Is that decreasing the probability of linking? Um, you could do things like you know, uh, direct tests on that. Why, why would you have them? I mean, you could have, now once I've gone to logistic, I could put in any type of variable here I want. Yeah, I mean, it could be d discrete or continuous. Yes, yeah, yeah. But if I have continuous, then I'm going to be forced to have some formulation, which is, I, I can't go to, the, to this standard block model. So the block models goes back to Harrison White and uh, I guess in the 1960s and 70s in the sociology literature, they were looking at, at trying to I, I find, find the blocks um, in, uh, of types in the society that were dictating who was forming relationships. And so they were looking at trying to decompose networks based on, on what they were seeing. And so that comes into thinking of finite, there's this finite set of types that matter. But more generally, we might have continuous covariates that we're working with as well. Okay, so, so just an example of you know, fitting one of these. So remember I, I showed you um, when we we're doing a friendship paradox, I showed you uh, a village from a, a, um, India where we had households and they were sharing kerosene and rice. This is that same village. So this is actually village 26 from a, a data set, that data set. And here what, what we've done is, is code it by um, caste. So these are color coded by caste. And in particular, the blue are what known as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So these are the disadvantaged castes in the system. Um, and red are general or otherwise backward castes. And here you begin to see um, you know, that there's going to be splits in the network that are dependent on, on caste. And we could just fit a, a simple block model. So we could ask, what's the probability that you connect to the same color? What's the probability that we have a link of, between links of two different colors? So we could just ask what those relative probabilities are. And here, the probability that you have a cross link across two um, nodes of different colors is um, uh, six-tenths of a percent um, standard error of about 0.001. The probability um, that you have one within is about 9%. So you have roughly um, you know, sort of a one and a half times higher, sorry, uh, 15 times higher probability of connecting within caste than across caste. Um, where here the caste is just done in a really crude um, split. So there you can test that this is statistically significant. These are statistically distinguished from each other. So you, know, you could use a block model to do that. 
It doesn't tell us anything about why homophily is coming up or whether, you know, it's just telling us that there's a statistically significant difference in the frequency of links within and across. So block models will be useful for doing that, but they're not going to be useful for doing much more than that. And we can't really interpret what that correlation means or where it came from. Right? Questions? Okay. Okay, so what's missed is this idea, you know, that, that, that often there's correlation in, in structure, so block models aren't going to have that kind of richer structure of clustering and triangles present in networks. Um, and actually there's an interesting uh, quote by Jacob um, Levy Moreno and Helen Hall that goes back, Helen Hall Jennings, goes back to 1938 where they actually say, look, if you want to build a statistical model of networks um, that deals with social configurations, it should be dealing with them as wholes and not single series of facts, more or less artificially separated from the total picture. So actually, you know, looking at, at, at something like a block model where we're just looking at individual bilateral relationships is missing the social influences that are putting why you form links in context. And so any model that we have should have something richer into that formation process. And we've seen that in the previous models, say the strategic formation models, then my payoff depends on what other connections are there. Or in preferential attachment, it depended on what kinds of connections you already had. So the bigger picture was present in those models, but that's not true in the, in the block models. And so now we, we want something where it's tractable. You know, we'd like something which is tractable, easy to work with data, and still has this kind of feature. Yes, so there's a, there's a fairly large literature known as the community detection literature. And what the community detection literature does is say, for instance, let's go back to this picture. This is a good example. So um, here, let's suppose uh, we just, you know, so we, I've given you two different attributes. We could say, is there more driving this, this graph? Okay, well, um, have a look. People see another cut in this graph. So if I drew a line right here and had these blues over here and these blues over here, there's basically one connection between these two, right? But every, every, there's no other connections between any of these blues and any of these blues. So in fact, these are segregated, these sets of, uh, are, are segregated more strongly than the others. It turns out in this village, there's a uh, Hindu Muslim population and you're seeing a split that's actually based on religion. Now, if we didn't know the religions, we could, have de we, could, we could still go through and say, ah, you know, there's actually some other attribute that's here. Not sure what it is, but it's driving this split. And so what you can begin to do is now, you give me a graph, and I'll try and find the components of the graph by looking at its structure. And there's a fairly large literature, and some of it uses spectral decomposition, you know, based on eigenvectors ve and eigenvalues. Other techniques, there's this whole series of algorithms that have been but basically what you want to do is re rediscover the pieces of the network. Um, and you can do that endogenously from a network. It's a very interesting but, but fairly large um, and unwieldy literature. Okay, so this is actually Marino in 1932. Um, actually did one of the first uh, diagrams that you'll see. Okay, so, so let me close by talking a little bit more about uh, econometric models. I'm going to spend a little time talking about what are known as exponential random graph models, which are sort of the um, richest form of models that are out there. They're being used quite extensively, and I, I want to sort of talk about what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then talk about um, sort of what the alternative models are that are being developed and, and why they're being developed. So this is now to sort of push us. What we've done is we've taken a snapshot of looking at different types of models, and now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the frontier looks like and, and where the holes are. Okay, so what's the idea behind an exponential random graph model? So we want a model where we can put in, you know, maybe we want it to depend on links like in a, a model um, like the block model, but suppose we also want to fit clustering. So we think that the probability of a graph actually depends not only on how many links it has, but how many triangles it has. Or we might think that the probability of a graph depends on what its path lengths are. So we think that, that graphs that have shorter, shorter average path lengths should be more likely than, than ones that have larger ones. So one way to, to actually specify this and to test whether we're seeing some process would just be to write down the statistics that we think sh we, we really want to be testing for. 
and see whether they matter in determining the probability of the graph. Is the probability of the graph immune to this or is it really dependent on this? So what we want is we want the probability to depend on some list of characteristics of the graph. And here I've just picked two. So we want to ask whether you know, graphs with lots of triangles are more, more likely than ones with fewer triangles. So we could test then you know, whether this beta t is, is positive if that's one of our hypotheses. Okay, so how do we, how do, we do this? Well, first of all, um, we want this to be a probability. And if, you know, if, if maybe the graph doesn't like triangles, then this should be a negative um, so if I, if I want graphs that have very few triangles, then this should be a negative parameter. I want to allow for negative parameters in this. I can't have negative probabilities. So the, the family that is usually used for this is um, I'll, I'll just have it be exponential then. So take, take the probability of the graph being proportional to the exponent of this. And then now I can put in negative coefficients and so forth, and I still get out a positive, um, uh, positive number. So the exponential family is a family that's been studied very extensively in, in statistics. We know lots about it. So it's not surprising that people have used the exponential family to try and fit general classes of, of um, network models. So the idea is now the probability of my graph depends on an exponential function of some list of statistics that it has times some parameters. Okay? So very flexible general kind of model. So that's, this is what's known as the exponential random graph models, okay? Ergoms for short. They're also known as P-star models, Markov chain. Uh, so there, there's a, a history behind them, but they've, the name has evolved into Ergoms. Question so far? Okay. Okay, so um, I want the probability to, to depend on this. There's actually a, a powerful theorem by Hammersley and Clifford. It's a very easy one to prove, but, but quite powerful. You give me any network model you want on a finite set of nodes, and I can find you a list of statistics such that it can be written in this functional form as exponential of coefficients times those statistics. So any model that you give me, give me any model you want at all that has probabilities of different graphs, there are a list of statistics and a set of coefficients such that you can write it in this fu functional form. Okay. Um, it, you know, the, the list of statistics could be really long, so it's not a terribly interesting theorem. But what it says is that this is a fairly flexible class of models that will allow you to fit pretty much any, approximate any probability distribution that you want over graphs can be approximated into this class. So I won't go through anything more than to say this is a pretty rich class and, and this is a evidence of that. Okay. Um, you can do this, say, erdash rini How does erdash rini that's a graph model we know. What is, how does it fit into the exponential family? How can I write it as an exponential family? Does it look like the exponential family I would expect? Um, P is the probability of a link. Let's let link L of G be the number of links in G. The probability of a, a graph G in an erdash rini random graph is P to the, you know, all those links were present. 1 minus P that uh, of the remaining links were not present. So this is the actual probability of some graph. And now I want to rearrange this so it looks like an exponential. Um, what does this look like? Well, I can collect the L's here. This looks like P over 1 minus P to the L of G, and then 1 minus P just to the number of nodes. So this looks like an exponential of log of P over 1 minus P times L of G, and then uh, a big term that's remaining, so this doesn't have anything from G in it. So basically it looks like exponential of a statistic minus um, a constant. So you get it exactly in this functional form that they're claiming, where now this statistic is the number of links. So not surprisingly, all that matters in specifying an erdash renyi random graph where all that's going on is we're varying the probability of links is just looking at the link parameter, and that's enough to get you this functional. So it fits into that functional form. And generally, you're saying any model you have, you can rewrite in an exponential form according to some statistic. Is that clear? Okay. So what's the trick and why? And I think this is important um, conceptually just to try and understand where are the really difficult parts in estimating networks. So this is, if we understand why these are going to be hard to estimate, we'll understand why a lot of models are going to be hard to estimate. 
So what's difficult about estimating these things? So there's sort of two things that are going on. One is to actually make this a probability, we're going to have to, you know, I was saying it's proportional to this, but to have this be a probability so that this sums to one across all the graphs, I have to normalize by summing this up over all possible graphs, right? So I've got a probability for each graph. In order for it to be a probability, I have to normalize by the total sum of the probabilities. Okay, so, so I need that. Well, that means that now this is going to be hard to calculate. Why is it hard to calculate? Because I'm summing over a really large set. So as we talked about before, you give me 30 nodes and I've got this enormous number of networks. Uh, there's no possible way to compute this with a computer. Even with a small number of nodes, I can't, I can't compute this. So I can never compute the actual probability of any graph if you give me, you know, give me some potential um, parameters that you want to estimate and see whether this is, uh, um, you know, calculate the probabilities for this. If I want to do something like maximum likelihood, I'm going to have to be able to calculate probabilities. I can't calculate them. It's just impossible. Okay? So that's one challenge. What's the second challenge? The second challenge is, how many data points do I have? I have one realization. I, I get one, one graph usually. Normally I'm looking, you know, at... at what those, those come up in learning models too? In learning models? Um, no, no, decision models. Decision models. Decision models. It, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on sort of... If you, th if you start thinking about the decision models where you've got a tree of possible decisions, and that's growing exponentially, um, the, the possible number of calculations you're going to have to do is going to explode. And, yeah, and so what you're going to have to do is you have to have, to have some heuristic approximation to it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, but, but for instance here, you know, doing a calculation of, of what's the probability of this thing um, is, is going to be really complicated. And basically what I, all I've got is one realization of this network. So, the, the, you know, if I wanted to estimate P in, in the erdos renyi random network, well, then I treat each link as an observation. I could say, you know, each, each pair of nodes that could have a link or not, I treat as an observation. Well, that's fine if all of these are independent observations, then I can use them as independent observations. The problem is when, I, when I'm thinking of the network now as having, maybe these links are no longer independent, but they're, they're dependent on the other no links that are present next to them. Now all the links are correlated. So the presence of any link is correlated with its neighboring links, which could be present with its neighboring. So now I've got the whole thing being correlated, which means that now I have to treat this whole graph as one observation rather than treating it as a bunch of independent observations. And then you have to look at many villages. Yeah, so one possibility is I have, if I'm lucky enough to have many villages, then I can do some statistical analysis. And, and there are data sets that look like that. Problem is that maybe I'm dealing with Facebook data, right? So how do I deal with that? I've got one graph. But I do, in some sense, have lots of observations. There's lots of people in Facebook. Can I chop it into individual pieces? Maybe I can chop it into small pieces and treat each one as an independent graph. And effectively, when you look down here, maybe one possibility is I'll, I'll, I'll look at one giant graph, but I'll say, okay, well, the Facebook graph is in many different countries. I'll treat each country as a separate observation, and now I'll treat them as many observations. That's one possibility. But that means that I have to really have approximate independence with distance. And unfortunately, when you look at the Facebook graph, it doesn't have that property. There's actually nodes that are links that are going across countries, and they're going across countries in correlated ways. So that's not a good approximation. So, so that's, that's actually... This, you know, ho hoping for many graphs or trying to chop your graph into many graphs is one possibility. But the other possibility is just to try and estimate this thing directly, right? And so what people tend to do is, is okay, well, we can't calculate this thing, but maybe we can sample some networks, right? So, so we won't look at the whole set, but we'll sample some. And so um, what people have used is what are known as MCMC techniques. So use Monte Carlo... Uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. So what you do is you just pick, so think of, we, we want to we calculate what this denominator is to figure out what the probability of a given graph is. So we're not going to be able to, to calculate it, for, sum it up for all possible networks. So we'll just pick a bunch of networks, a random sample. And how are we going to do that? Well, we have some technique of sampling the space. 
Markov chain Monte Carlo means you start at some network and then you follow a particular algorithm for moving from that network to another out network, recalculate, go to another network, recalculate, and then that's the way you estimate this denominator. And so um, Tom Snyder's Mark Hancock came up with some papers in 2002, 2003 that provided a particular search algorithm for searching this space of networks. Okay. So then what you did is they started programming this and then people started using the program. So you put in the algorithm, it estimates this thing down here. Now, um, what do I do in order to estimate things? I feed in my graph, I give it to the computer. Now it can begin to search over a grid of different parameters and try and figure out what's the one that leads to the highest likelihood of seeing my graph. So I could you know, start with some parameters, I calculate what's the probability of my graph. I put in another set of parameters, I calculate what's the probability of my graph. And now I do this by each time estimating what the denominator is through this, this MCMC technique. Okay? So if I get accurate estimates of what those probabilities are, then I just find the parameters that give me the highest likelihood that would be maximum likelihood estimation. So I, I just try and maximize, find the B, the betas, which give me the highest probability of seeing the graph I saw, and then use those as my estimates. So is it clear what uh, the, the uh, idea is here? How much can we give the dimension? So, I mean, obviously as I increase K, that's gonna become more difficult computationally. As I try and get more accurate estimates of the denominator, that's gonna be become more complicated because I have to do more iterations. So I, there's no set formula for how large K can be. It's gonna depend on how large your graph is and, and so forth. You can fit them into the computer. The difficulty is that in fact, um, what the computer is doing is pulling some subset of these out just randomly and it's not necessarily getting a good, you know, we, if, as we said, 30 nodes, we've got two to the 435 possible graphs that's gotta be checking. If it checks 10,000, that's not many graphs at all, right? That's, that's a tiny, tiny proportion of the, of the overall fraction of graphs. So what, what it does is it explicitly, so um, it, it's, yeah, I, um, I don't wanna go into the details of exactly how it works, but the, let me give you a heuristic description of what it does. So what it does is think of it as, as trying to get an estimate of estimating. So suppose we sample 10,000 of these. We're gonna march through and, and get 10,000 of them. And then from this, it's gonna try and extrapolate what this, what this is what this uh, overall normalizing coefficient is. So if I sampled 10,000 over two to the 435, then I could just take what my sum is for this 10,000 and scale it up by two to the 435 over um, 10,000, right? So I just multiply it up and that'll give me what this coefficient should be. It does a slightly different calculation than that, but that's essentially what it's trying to do. Yeah, it tries to estimate this thing. And then what it's going to do is it's going to iterate over the betas. For each beta, it'll try, it, it'll go through this sample. It'll get me uh, an estimate of what the probability is. And then it's going to search over a grid of betas and try and pick out the beta that gives me the best overall match to the, the highest probability of seeing the realized graph. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so exactly, so I, I could think of this as um, links between blue nodes, links between blue and red nodes. Um, so you can pretty much stick whatever statistic you want in there and, and that'll, that, that's fine. So that's part of the wonder, wonderfully nice part about this functional form is I can stick in whatever I want there, exactly. So I can stick in stuff with node characteristics. Okay, so, so how well is it doing in terms of, it, you know, so as I said, you know, it's, it's not, it's trying to sample too many things. So sampling Gs aren't gonna lead to accurate estimates. There's actually a theorem by Balmidi, Bresler, and Sly, um, 2008, that sort of says, okay, look, uh, it's looking at a subclass of ergoms, not all ergoms. But what it does is it proves if you've got a dense enough class of ergoms, um, if you're using the MCMC techniques that are actually being used in the programs, these um, 
basically they're using a particular type of dynamic, um, global dynamics um, based on Gibbs sampling. When, so if you're using a particular algorithm for searching that space, the estimates will be accurate in less than exponential time in the number of nodes only if the networks have approximately independent links. Okay. So if, if it happened to be that we wrote down a model that looked like a block model originally, which we could have just estimated directly, so if we didn't have any correlation between links, then you can estimate it using this technique. But if you don't, then it's not going to converge in less than exponential time. So um, this is a pretty damaging theorem, I think, for, for this class of models. And, and basically what happens is the way that people use these ergoms is that you, you, you stick in your, your model to the software, it spits out um, some, some parameters, and then people will then try, try it a bunch of times and then see whether it gives them back pr the same parameters. And if it's giving back the same parameters, then you say, oh, well, you know, I must have had a good, I got lucky. Um, for me, the, the model that I happened to specify didn't seem to suffer too much from this problem. Um, everything's okay. But the, the theorem here is pretty disturbing in the sense that it says, you know, you're, you're searching a space. We're looking at, say, 10,000 graphs pulled out of a space of two to the whatever it's going to be, depending on how many nodes you have. I've got a huge space. I'm searching a small part. I'm probably not going to get an accurate estimate of the probabilities. And, and here it shows that generally, um, unless you're, you know, you've got uh, really correlated, uh, uncorrelated links, um, searching that space is going to be really hard to find representative um, networks. Okay, is it, is it clear what, sort of what this? Okay, let me just take you through. Um, I'll just show you a quick simulation. So this, what is this? This is. Let's try and run the programs. Let's just run one of these programs and see what we get out of estimating. So what I did is just fit in um, 50 nodes. We're going to do a thousand different estimations from the program of a, an exponential random graph model. And what I'm going to do is each time I'm going to fit, I'm going to give it a network that has 20 isolated nodes, 10 triangles, and 45 links. So I'm going to give it exactly the same structure, just for different variations of graphs each time. And then um, given that it has exactly the same structure in terms of its statistics, all those graphs have exactly the same probabilities in these models. It should give me back the same betas every time. Okay. So every time I give it the, this, the program should give me back the same estimates. And here's the distribution of estimates on link parameters. Um, so it's quite, quite wide. It ranges from minus 3 up to 4. In fact, the right parameter is around minus 2. So it doesn't actually ever hit the right parameter. Um, it gives you quite a, quite a range. This is pretty close. to The, the right um, uh, isolates parameter is a little more than 16. It actually does okay on that one. Um, the right triangles parameter is actually negative. Um, it's, it's not hitting that at all. So it's giving me a completely different distribution. So, you know, it's not working. And it, it shouldn't be expected to work given the, the actual problems that it, it are being faced. Um, <coughs> so now let's actually take the parameters that it spits out and recreate, try, recreate graphs from it. So you can actually have it generate graphs. So I'll, I feed it a graph with um, 20 isolates, 40, I don't remember this precise numbers, 45, uh, 20 isolates, 45 links, and 10 triangles. Feed it that graph. It gives me some parameters. And now I ask, ask it to recreate a graph and ask, see what comes out. What comes out of that? Well, remember it had 45 links. This is the distribution of of graphs that it actually gives me back from its model that it created. Um, most of them have in the order of you know, three to 500 links. Occasionally it gets lower, but it never comes anywhere close to 45. Um, it does really well in the isolates. It seemed to really hit well. And then when I do the triangle count, it had 10. And normally it's giving me somewhere between 1,500 and 3,500 <laughs> um, triangles. So it's just, you know, it's, it's not working, and the theorem told us it shouldn't work, right? And, and sort of, I, I, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a very simple model. This is, use, this is using the R package of StatNet for ergoms. 
So this is the CAN software that a lot of people use for this. And it's just a real caution to say exponential random graph models are not easy to estimate and we don't know how to estimate them. So, you know, there, there, there's some problems there. Um, so basically, for this class, they're not estimable that I know of. Um, which formulation should you use? They're being used quite a bit. Um, you're not sure, you know, so, so there's issues here. Uh, they're very wonderfully flexible, powerful, but there's some problems. So there's other alternatives here. I'm not going to have time to go through these. They've all got their pluses and minuses. You know, one is to assume lots of independence. Um, other is to try and, you know, deal with a multiple equilibrium problem and get some implications from, from pairwise stability. Another is to build a different class of models that sort of circumvents the, the estimation problems of the exponential random graph models. You can do that, but you can only do it with certain kinds of subgraphs. So there's different approaches you can use that overcome some of these, but this is sort of an active area where we really need a lot of work still, and, and um, there's still a lot to be done. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so I think, um, so one possibility is maybe we could just do better sampling. And I think that that's doomed. And I think it's doomed just because of the size of the space. So, you know, maybe you're, you're better at sampling 10,000 networks. You're still not getting, you know, it's just too big a dimensional space in terms of all the possible networks that are out there and what they look like in terms of their configurations. How many have lots of triangles and few links. And it's just a really rich space. And so even if you, you use a different sampling technique, you're still looking at, at too small a set out of its, I, I think that's the problem. But that's conjecture. So I, it's possible that there's some really clever sampling technique that somehow captures the richness of the space. But it's going to have to be much more sophisticated than the, the current MCMC techniques that are being used. Yeah. I think we should stop for a coffee break. So um, let's take some coffee. And Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>